Welcome to today's keynote session. I'm Durga Satapathy. I work in Sprint in the Technology Innovation and Architecture Group. And I also had the opportunity and the honor to serve as the Industry Forum and Exhibits Chair for this conference. And on that note, I want to take a minute to thank all the patrons and sponsors. I've done a fantastic job in the exhibits area. Also the distinguished uh, speakers, as well as the panelists and the moderators. So uh, we also have a CTO panel forum later, 2 o'clock this afternoon, so please stop by for that. Um, I'm sure you've all been very used to the way these keynotes work, but take a look at the, uh, the, the uh, method we have to submit your questions online. This is the pigeonhole at slash ICC 2018, so please use that to submit your questions, and we'll pick the best ones and have them available for the keynote uh, speakers. Uh, let me now take a couple of minutes to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Sau. So Dr. John So is the Chief Technology Officer at Sprint. He is responsible for technology development, network planning, engineering, deployment, and service assurance of the Sprint network. Prior to this, he was Chief Network Officer at Sprint. And before that, uh, before Sprint's acquisition of Clearwire, Dr. So was CTO there. And he joined Clearwire actually as a second employee in 2003. And since then, uh, glorious six years, and at 2009 and 2010, he led the team that built the first 4G network in North America, covering more than 130 million people. Prior to Clearwire, Dr. Sao served in executive positions at Netrocorp, now SR Telecom, also at AT&T Wireless, Nortel, and Bell Northern Research. Dr. Sao has a doctorate in electrical engineering from McMaster University, Canada. His dissertation on low-loss surface acoustic wave, or SAW, devices, is recognized as a pioneering work that has helped enable a new generation of RF signal processing elements used in all mobile phones today. He has published more than 15 technical papers and has six U.S. patents in wireless technologies. Uh, last year in April, Dr. Sao was appointed to the Broadband Deployment Advisory Committee by the FCC Commissioner, FC, uh, Chairman Ajit Pai. He uh, also currently serves on the advisory board to the Global TDD LT Initiative, or GTI, which is an international industry consortium. So with that, I'd like to invite Dr. Saw to come on up. Good morning. I, I paid Gunter $20 to uh, say all the good things about me and run the clock out a little bit. Um, actually, I forgot my clicker. Durga, can you get my clicker? Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, this is uh, one of the first for me in a long time. I usually speak at conferences with a lot of industry people. This is one of the few where you have a lot of academia people and research people and not many industry people. So it's refreshing and, and I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard the story about uh, the academia guy that went camping with the industry guy. No? So they both went camping. And, and the, the prof said, hey, I'll, I'll get food and you cook dinner. Sounds like a good deal. The engineer was preparing his fire for, for dinner and he heard rustling in the bushes and out ran the, the prof for his life. And right behind him was a big back bear. And then the professor yelled, here's dinner, you cook it. <laughs> so I'm here today to tell you how we're deploying massive MIMO. Um, I know you've got, you guys have done a lot of groundwork on everything that we need for massive MIMO, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're actually going to deploy it. Um, so this is my first chart. Um, you know, it just seems like yesterday that uh, we just locked down on the 5G non-standalone standard. I actually was just December. But the GSMA is already predicting that in five to seven years, you're going to have more 5G connections than LTE. Right? Believe me, I think we all know that between now and then, there is a heck of a lot of work to do right? in order to, to make that a reality, because the LTE networks today are actually pretty good. Right? Now, at the same time, we also realize with the density and the real-time connectivity that we're demanding of our, that our customers are demanding, and, and for themselves, as well as for the toys, um, we do need a more capable network. The, the existing network, as good as the LTE network is, it, it's, it's, it doesn't meet all the needs for what we need in the future, where you're talking about a lot of density, a lot more bandwidth, 
a lot more reliability and security, right? And a lot more real time, low, low latency capability. And that's where we think 5G can, can make sure that we feel the need. 10 times more capacity, uh, 10 times more throughput, 100 times more density, and much lower latency as well. So 5G is not going to just give us a better or faster smartphone, because I think our, our phones are as, as smart, as, as fast as they can be. But I think 5G will enable a much richer mobile experience. Uh, things like um, you know, rich user-generated content. Uh, you're not going to get congestion when you're all in a stadium trying to uh, do your Snapchats. Um, immersive experience will be much better when you have a more real-time network with lower latency. You know, if you ever put, it, put, put in one of those uh, AR, VR goggles and you feel sick or nauseous, that means that you have a pretty shitty network, right? If you have 5G with lower latency, you're not supposed to feel that way, right? And that's what, what is, one of the promises of 5G uh, can, can get us. But more importantly, I think 5G is going to disrupt many verticals. If you take a step back and you look at LTE, what did LTE do for us, right? It, it, it actually helped create a lot of disruptors like Uber, like Lyft, Airbnb, Snapchat, right? And then if you look at some of the global companies we have, Amazon, uh, Apple, Netflix, Facebook, it opened up new opportunities for them and, 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 and took them to the next level in terms of the customers that they can reach with LTE. Right, if you imagine what 5G can do right, in, in the space like autonomous manufacturing, like who is going to be the next Uber in agriculture? Right? Who is going to disrupt the, the, uh, the uh, public safety space or, or the uh, utility and energy space? Right? I, it's something that we cannot even imagine with all the brain power in this room or all the use cases that when you have a real-time dense network with immense amount of capacity can do to disrupt all these verticals. And that's the promise of 5G. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is Sprint going to do about 5G network. And any discussion about Sprint right, is going to start with the most important asset we have, which is our spectrum. Sprint has more spectrum than any other operator in the United States, primarily in a 2.5 gigahertz band. Right? And with 5G, for the first time, we're pretty much going to use up every megahertz we have in a 2.5 band. We're going to simultaneously enable LTE and 5G on the 2.5 band. So what that means is that we're able to have the same footprint in terms of coverage between 5G and 4G. It's not easy to do if you are building your 5G network on millimeter wave and your LTE network is running on cellular channels. Right? The coverage is not going to be the same. But for us, if we are leveraging it and we do it right uh, in split mode, uh, we can do that. It also means that we don't have to look for so many new towers, which takes time to build. But we can leverage existing towers and upgrade them uh, with massive MIMO to enable split mode, LTE, and 5G. So Sprint is one of the few operators globally that can truly deliver LTE and 5G simultaneously on the same spectrum band using 100 to 200 megahertz of spectrum. Right? That is, we, we feel, is the differentiator for Sprint, and that's how we're going to focus our 5G build. Now, a few weeks ago, Sprint and T-Mobile announced that we're going to um, merge and put a company together. And, and one of the biggest motivations why we're going to do that is because together, the two of us can build a better 5G network and build it faster. All right, if you look on the left side of, of this chart here, each of the operators today are essentially trying to make laminate out of whatever lemons that they have, the 5G laminate, right? Millimeter wave, this is all you have, you're going to build a 5G story around that. Right? For Sprint, it's going to be on 2.5 gigahertz. T-Mobile, Thanks to the, to the last auction that we did, they have a lot of 600 megahertz uh, spectrum and, and millimeter wave. If you put T-Mobile and Sprint together, you can essentially build the first nationwide 5G network ubiquitously with ubiquitous coverage 5G, right? Low band, 
for rural coverage, mid-band metro uh, areas, and a millimeter away for dense urban as you need it. That, that's like, you know, the perfect wedding cake, right? If you're trying to do the same thing with millimeter waves, it, it's not gonna be possible, right? Everybody in this room knows that. It's gonna cost trillions of dollars and millions of cell sites, right? That's not, that's not gonna fly. So together, we can build a 5G network faster and with a much wider coverage with a lot of capacity. But I want to spend the rest of my talk talking about what is Sprint doing about it in the 2.5 band. So we're going to leverage a concept called Massive MIMO. And I, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys did all the foundational work for this. I'm just deploying it. Right? It leverages a large number of antennas and advanced antenna processing to improve performance. Right? Why did we pick Massive MIMO? Because I think that is the sweet spot technology for 2.5. For one thing, the 2.5 gigahertz band in the United States is TDD. Same like what they're using in China, in Japan, and, and in India. Right? TDD is ideal for Massive MIMO. You guys are all purists. In, you, you all know that you know, Massive MIMO doesn't work so hard for FDD. Right? Uh, with FDD, you don't have reciprocity of your channels and you need a lot of overhead so you, you, don't have, you cannot build so many antenna elements. But TDD, it's awesome. The other thing is that at 2.5 gigahertz, the spectrum is high enough that your antenna elements uh, is, is manageable. So we can squeeze 128 antenna elements in the 64 T64R configuration. By the way, this is a Nokia radio and you can see that on the booth uh, outside on the exhibit floor. Um, and, and still, the size is actually smaller than the existing antenna we use today. Right? Imagine trying to do the same thing at 700 megahertz on FDD. It's not possible. It'd be the size of a car that you have to install on a tower. Right? But for 2.5 gigahertz, because it's at the right spectrum band, and using TDD, we're able to leverage this technology. And, and the strategy is very simple. We're going to upgrade thousands of our cell sites, and we have started doing that. Um, with Massive MIMO to support both LTE and 5G simultaneously at existing sites. So there's efficiency in capital, because I don't need to be looking for new small cells and new towers to build my first 5G footprint. I'm just upgrading existing towers in, in basically metro areas, right, where I need the capacity growth, and simultaneously turn on LTE and 5G at the same time, using a concept called split mode, which is some clever software that our, our vendors have been able to, to put together, right? And essentially, we're killing two birds with one stone, okay? So, by the way, this, this chart here is my most technical chart as a tribute to all of you. Um, you know, multi-user MIMO is a key enabler why we can get the spectrum efficiency, right? As opposed to just using a PRB for, you know, for, for, for one user, with, with massive MIMO, because you can create narrow beams, you can reuse the same frequency time resource, or your PRB, uh, it, it, with multiple users, each with a narrow beam. Right? That's where the spectral efficiency comes in, and that's why you see on the bottom chart that the spectral efficiency is so much higher and over a much larger area. And then you couple that with multidimensional beamforming, right? Not just horizontal, and, but vertical beamforming, you get better decorrelation of your beams, and you get even more capacity and better performance. So it works exceptionally well in metro areas when you have users in different buildings, different levels. Right? We were very surprised when we first did the test in Suwon in Korea and in Seattle how well multi-beam, uh, uh, um, three-dimensional beam forming actually worked. So net net is, in some of the early test results we saw on the bottom right of the page, you can see eight times improvement in network capacity. Sometimes you get four, sometimes you get 10. Uh, depends on the morphology and, and what you're baselining against. Throughput goes up six times for a 64 to 64R radio over an 88R. Um, you get coverage gain as well, especially on your uplink. Right? So far, it looks promising. Uh, so a few months ago, we did a test in Seattle. Uh, we wanted to see how Massive MIMO would actually work in a real-life environment. So we actually replaced one of our cell sites in downtown Seattle and put up a massive MIMO radio instead. Uh, we use an E-band uh, wireless backhaul uh, for, for backhaul, 
uh, because of the massive amount of bandwidth it needed. And just for fun, we thought we'll, te we'll test it against you know, our competitors as a benchmark. Um, we actually, you know, rather, rather than me ex trying to explain to you what happened, we actually have a video that I was gonna, I'm going to show you now. Uh, some of you have, may have seen it and, and because we posted this on YouTube. But for those of you who haven't seen it, I'm going to play it. It's only a, a two-minute video. Uh, I, I like to keep seeing it over and over again because I like how this, uh, this movie ends. <laughs> so we're going to play it. At Sprint, we're always enhancing our LTE Plus network. One of those technologies is Massive MIMO. Massive MIMO allows more customers to be on our network without noticing a drop in speed or performance. So let's test it. We took 100 smartphones from each carrier, put them in a signal-dense area, in this case, Myrtle Edwards Park, and had them trigger a download. If they complete the download in 15 seconds or less, a whiteboard will be raised. If it takes longer than 15 seconds, no boards are raised. Mm. Here's what happened. Our first competitor test Start. Only 13 out of 100. Our second competitor test. Start. Only 16 out of 100. Our third competitor test. Start. Only six out of 100. Looks like someone's network isn't built for unlimited. Here comes Sprint. Let's go. Start. Sprint crushed it. 100 out of 100. Faster downloads even in densely populated areas. Can you hear that? Sprint works for me. I told you I like the ending. Um, <laughs> it, it's not even a, a fair fight. It's like showing up in a knife fight with a bazooka, right? But we wanted to show the power of Massive MIMO when you actually deploy this, right? The other thing that Massive MIMO does for us is that we, you know, we can actually operate this in split mode to actually enable both LTE and 5G simultaneously. Essentially, we can logically split the antenna into two, where we allocate half the antenna resources for LTE and the other half for 5G and R. And with some clever software from our vendors, we operate in split mode so that you don't lose your instantaneous bandwidth. It's still 60 megahertz. Now, for us to pull this trick off, you need a lot of spectrum, which we do. Right, so that's why I say we're going to use up every megahertz we have in 2.5. Right, we're going to allocate 60 megahertz for LTE, which is enough to drive three channel carrier aggregation. And we're also going to allocate another 60 megahertz for 5G. And you connect them to your phones with dual connectivity, you are basically are, are able to leverage 120 megahertz of, of, of capacity. Right, that is why you, you know, we can show up in a, in a knife fight with a bazooka when you do that, right? And so that's a plan, basically, to operate our sites in split mode. And, and we've started building, we've started field testing, and we've already started, basically, upgrading our sites in the major markets, right? And so the way dual connectivity would work is that, you know, this is 5G, non-standalone. So we're going to be using an LTE EPC to start. You're going to anchor on your LTE control channels. Right, but each of, you, each of us will have different uh, user tra plane traffic now, 5G and LTE, and you connect to your phones with Dual Connect. Right? And, and that's how we can and, and basically drive a lot more capacity and much higher throughputs for our customers. And if you look at some of the uh, capacity that we're forecasting based on the testing we have done, uh, typically an LTE network with gigabit capability 4x4 four four MIMO, 256 QAM, you can get about a gigabit per second per site, uh, per sector, or three gigabit per second. With massive MIMO, we think we can get to nine gigabit per second. With a slightly wider band radio, uh, you can get 12. 
and ultimately you go to mixed mode, and standalone you can get basically a lot more capacity, like 33 gigabit per second per site, right? A lot of what we see on the right still needs to be tested, uh, but that's what we think we can get in terms of peak throughput, right? A lot of stuff that on the left is being tested right now, and the results so far looks pretty promising for the right channel conditions. So, just to wrap up, we've started building um, massive MIMO and upgrading in our sites in many markets. Uh, we're actually upgrading thousands of them. But we are focused on the first nine metro markets, um, just because we wanted to make sure that there is a, a strong footprint, a ubiquitous, ubiquitous coverage of 5G, so that when we roll out our first 5G smartphone, uh, you don't keep bouncing between 5G and LTE, even though the experience is not going to be all that bad, but you, you want the customers to keep seeing 5G on their phones. That's going to be a differentiator for Sprint. So we're going to basically launch uh, nine metro markets and, and in basically nine clusters, in mostly around the, the metro downtown areas. And these are actually pretty big clusters. They are not hot zones. Uh, I think in Phoenix, it's, we're, it, our cluster is about 230 square miles, covering a million people. Uh, New York, we're going to cover all of Manhattan, uh, uh, mostly around, actually Midtown to Wall Street, about half, half, half a million to a million people too. So there's going to be a substantial footprint and we're very excited to roll it out. But for us to pull this off, Sprint cannot do this by ourselves. Neither can any of the other operators. Right? You need a big ecosystem. Uh, and, and we need everybody's help in this room to, to keep pushing uh, the progress that we have made so far and, 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 and look at new frontiers. Right? The, the wireless industry is going to spend $275 billion in the next few years building a 5G network and a 5G ecosystem that we need for it. We're going to create up to 3 million new jobs because it's a massive undertaking. Right? For, for the academia and the research community, a big thank you for what you've done. I would not be up here talking about Massive MIMO had you not figured out the details behind it and did all the triple integrals. Right? Somebody would have figured out how many bits we need for the A to D and D to A for the antennas. Right? Somebody's figured out how to do spatial multiplexing. And many of you are still working on channel estimation to get even better capacity. Right, so a big thank you. But if you look ahead, right, there are a lot of other things that we, we need to be focused on. 5G NR is not done yet. Right, we have the non-standalone. We still need to lock down the standalone specs in release 15. There's release 16 coming on. IoT, V2X, network security. Right, immense number of areas that still needs your help and, and, and your creativity to, to, to get those uh, problems solved. Um, timely evolution of 5G standards. Like I said, we're not quite done yet. We're just in the beginning of the journey to get our 5G standards uh, uh, ratified. Right, there's release 16, there's release 17 coming, uh, evolution. Right, I assume some of you are already thinking about how do we get one terabit per second in my cell sites, right, since we're already doing gigabit per second LTE. Right, that's going to push new frontiers. I don't think the electromagnetic spectrum is going to be enough to do one terabit per second. Right? So those are the concepts that we need you to be thinking ahead. Um, ecosystem partners. We are glad we have partners like Qualcomm that we work with. Right? We're going to be using the Fusion 855 chipset with an SDX50 uh, 5G modem to build our first smartphones. Without them, we wouldn't be able to roll out our first smartphones in less than a year. Right? Uh, partners like uh, Nokia and, and Ericsson are crucial to help us get split mode and a massive MIMO working. And last but not least, we need help from our government. The FCC has been very proactive recently to stream, help streamline and accelerate the process of building 5G infrastructure. Today, it takes more than a year to get a permit for a small cell. It takes one hour to deploy the small cell. We're not going to lead the world, the industry, if it takes forever to get permits, right? There has to be a more streamlined approach, and we're working closely with the CTIA and the FCC and GSMA to, 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 to make this happen, right? Obviously, we all need more spectrum. 5G is going to be a big drain on capacity. It needs a lot of capacity, and you need to fit the monster with better spectral efficiency, but also a lot more spectrum. 
Right? And on that, I'm going to uh, end my, my talk and be open to taking questions. Thank you for having me again. Well, thank you so much for the talk. And so the first question is that, how does the higher computational complexity and delay in massive MIMO processing affect the system performance? Sorry, can you run it through the question again? How does the higher computational complexity and delay in massive MIMO processing access, uh, sorry, affect the system performance? You know what, I think a systems expert said I can answer that, but my shot, my shot response would be that it does impact performance, and it's always going to be a compromise by the time we actually implement it. Um, and when you look at, uh, you know, the more layers you need to enable to, to create those uh, uh, different streams that you need for, your, for beamforming, it requires a lot of computation. There's a lot of, a lot of dependency on latency and delay. So at the end of the day, when we deploy this, it's always going to be a, 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 a compromise in terms of contamination, interference, and, and it, does, it does play a big role. It drives basically what's practical. It drives the number of antennas you can squeeze in. It also drives the size of the antenna. So absolutely, it's a very real world, it's a real world challenge. easy it is to deploy MIMO antennas on the current infra infrastructure, and what are the challenges to deploying? Actually, surprisingly, uh, when we say massive MIMO, it scares the shit out of people because that it's going to be massive, but it's not. I, I forgot to point out in one of my charts, a side-by-side -side comparison, the massive MIMO antenna is actually shorter, but slightly wider than the existing antenna. The other benefit is that in the present uh, configuration that we use for 2.5, we use an 8T8R configuration where you have the antenna separate from the RRH, the remote radio head, and then you need to use a coax cable to connect the two of them. So it's more cumbersome. With massive MIMO, thanks to advances that we have, that our vendors have made, everything is in one box. So you actually have a, a slightly smaller box, but the radio and the antennas are built in. And the reason why you want the, the radios right next to the antenna is because of the, first, the, 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 the guy that asked the first question is, is, is you're trying to minimize any, any degradation in delays and everything. So we actually have a very compact structure. Uh, it might be slightly heavier. Um, so far in the zoning and permitting applications we have done, we have not run into major problems. When we say, hey, we're gonna upgrade our system, taking down an antenna and a box and putting up a smaller box, uh, slightly heavier. Uh, we have not run into a, a lot of structural issues, so uh, we don't think it's going to be a major challenge. Um, you know, you still run CIPRI, basically your fiber connection down to your baseband unit, so that has not changed. Uh, we do need to upgrade our backhaul, but 90% of our backhaul is already fiber, so you, you either pay more, uh, buy the drink, or you put that fiber in. Yeah. Um, well, the next one is that, should we buy new smartphones, or software upgrade will be sufficient? Uh, for 5G NR, you'll need, you'll need new phones, and we'll be very happy to sell you new phones. Um, <laughs> um, the, the LTE phones that you have, which is pretty awesome, uh, will work well. Uh, with massive MIMO, you'll work even better, right? But uh, with, with 5G capable phones, you're gonna be able to enable the dual connectivity that I've shown in my chart, where you're able to connect LTE and 5G together to, to, to really enjoy the full benefits of our 5G and R. So you do, you will need the new 5G phones. Right. And how do you deal with um, ultra reliability and uh, ultra low latency requirements for small IT devices with 5G and LTE together? Well, that's a very good question. And the ultra reliability, low latency, uh, ha has a lot of challenges still that needs to be solved, and I'm looking around the room here for you guys to help figure some of those things out. Um, in order to get the low latency, you probably have to go to a standalone architecture and no longer depend on non-standalone. So, so you, will, you, know, you will have to leverage capabilities like edge computing, right? In, in places where you need ultra uh, reliable low latency, you may have to move your edge right to where the, 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 the application is. 
Um, and to minimize latency, you probably want to be using a 5G NRL link and not be anchored to LTE. So, so you, help, you have to have you know, a slice of the network that sits close to the application and where you have edge computing. That, that's how I think you're going to solve it. Now, we, we are not doing, rolling out any URLCC capabilities yet. We're just building the foundations for the first 5G. It's going to be NSA. Um, as an industry, uh, and with all of us here, we need to solve a lot of the uh, standalone challenges and lockdown respects for the core version we're going to be using, and, and also all the ultra reliability, low latency uh, capabilities that's needed. What are the most suitable channel models for massive MIMO? You know what? I would not know the answer for that. I just want to use the channel models that work. Um, <laughs> Dr. Sadapati will be able to answer that question and maybe Ron. Why would you want to connect the virtual reality goggles to the cellular network instead of Wi-Fi? Yeah, sure. I think the, the answer there is really one of mobility. I mean, there's a lot you can do with Wi-Fi in a stationary location, but anything it's been proven that anything people want to do in one location, they like to do in, in a mobile sense as well. So as soon as that capability is available, I'm sure it'll be used. Uh, virtual reality for gaming and such, maybe somebody think that's, that's frivolous, but people are talking about augmented reality and the ability to do that in scenarios where it is for industrial uses too. So you can imagine a technician that's uh, on a road trip going someplace where there's no Wi-Fi that needs to have support from a home office to, with augmented reality to help them sort through something complex they're trying to fix in the field. That's an example. So um, it shows that the sub six gigahertz massive MIMO works just fine, hundred out of hundred downloads uh, versus your competitors. Uh, the antenna size of sixty four transmit, sixty four uh, receiving uh, for sub six looks small. Uh, therefore, what is the motivation of millimeter wave? It's a good question. Uh, I think millimeter wave for us is something that's in the future. We don't have to go there yet because we have great capability with a massive MIMO radio. We're planning to deploy it right now. Um, but over time, if you think five, ten years from now, some point in time, the 200 megahertz of capacity we can deploy in massive MIMO in 2.5 will be not enough because the internet keeps growing, people keep using wireless for all sorts of new uses, and at some point in time we'll need that capacity. Well, right. thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ron.